All right, so we're in the last chapter of Romans. I tell you what, I've had a blast going through the book of Romans with you all. It's lived up to its reputation that it's the cathedral of theology. We have learned so much as we've gone through this book, haven't we? It's been a great book. I, I think I'd just like to stay in Romans until we get raptured. It's great stuff. And we learn about the depravity of man in this book, right? The theology of the depravity of man. We learned that Romans 3.10 tells us there's none righteous. What? Not even one. We learned that depravity of man, Romans 3.23, that all men, not some, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we also learned that God had a solution to that problem. And the solution was what we just celebrate in communion, Romans 5a. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? The solution to our sin problem was Jesus and the cross that he died on for our sins. And we learned also some great truths as we went through this book on justification by faith. The whole Protestant Reformation was based on the book of Romans. That Romans 5.1, therefore there is, you know, we, we, therefore we've been justified by faith. And thus we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We learn the great truth that it's nothing we've done that saves us. It's putting a saving faith in Jesus Christ and applying what we learn in Romans 10, 9, that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be what? Saved. That's all there is to it. But then we turn the corner in Romans 12 about how to live for Christ. We saw in Romans 12, 1 through 2, that, that we were urged as brethren by the mercies of God to what? Present our bodies to God as living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to him, which is our spiritual service of worship. And we're not to be conformed any longer to, to the things of this world. Not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By what we're doing right here. By the renewing of our minds. And as we're, our minds get renewed through God's word, we can prove the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect for our lives. So now we're going to close the chapter, the last chapter of this book, and then we'll be in 1 Corinthians next week, which will be an interesting book to study too, because it's written to the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. And it, had, and it wasn't just the pagan people in Corinth that had issues. We're going to see all throughout 1 Corinthians when we get there next week. It was a corrective letter for all the mess that was in the church in Corinth. And so it will be a corrective for us too as we go through that book. But this last chapter, interesting chapter, because it's a chapter of Paul addressing his friends that are already in Rome. Paul hadn't been to Rome, but he led a whole bunch of people to Christ and had a whole bunch of friends that all landed in Rome. All roads lead to Rome. And so we're going to see 26 friends listed by Paul in this closing chapter. And here's what we're going to see. As we see Paul list all these friends, he's writing from the church in Corinth. And he's got a letter that's going to Rome. And it's amazing to me, but he names 26 of his friends that are already in Rome. Amazing. By name. He names them. And then he gives characteristics of some of these Christians, which are going to teach us as we go through this final chapter about the Spirit of Christ. And we're going to see as we go through this final chapter and listing all these friends, we're going to see seven things that characterize the spirit of these friends, which was the Spirit of Christ in them. And th these, are, these seven things are things that should characterize our lives as Christians too. So we're going to see some examples of people that are filled with the Holy Spirit and have the Spirit of Christ and how it's exemplified in their lives and it should be exemplified in our lives too. So I'll give you seven things that characterize the Spirit of Christ in, in believers as we go through this chapter. And the first thing I'll give to you before you even look at the Scripture. First thing that char characterizes the Spirit of Christ from this chapter is it's the Spirit of friendship. It's the Spirit of friendship. It's amazing to me. Paul had 26 people he knew by name that landed in Rome before he even did, and he's naming them by name because you know what? Paul had a lot of friends. Paul wasn't just a soul winner. He was a friend maker, and we should be too. We should be too. We're supposed to not live in isolation. We're supposed to live in friendship with other believers in Christ, and that's the spirit of Christ because what did Jesus say? Greater love has no man than this. He laid down his life for his, what? Friends. 
friends. Jesus' spirit was a spirit of friendship. Our spirit should be a spirit of friendship too. Oh, I don't have any friends at Calvary Chapel because nobody at Calvary Chapel is friendly to me. Proverbs 18, 24, in the King James Version puts it this way. You want to have more friends? Prove yourself friendly. You want to have more friends? Listen, listen. You want to have more friends? Be a friend to more people. and You'll have more friends. And that's the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit of friendship. I'm about to go on a trip this afternoon. I'll be out of town the next few days because once every winter, my best friend from Chicago and I, we get out of town for three days. We, we have just a renewing our friendship in, and I'm flying out and I'm meeting him. I'm so excited. He's been my best friend for the last 30 some years. And one of the reasons why he's one of my best friends is because he loves Jesus and he loves me. And we, we, he, I talk to him every week still for 30 some years. And the dude lives a thousand miles away. I'm working on him. It was eight degrees last, and he had six inches of snow, and he's out there shoveling snow at 61 years old. He said, dude, time to move to South Carolina. What are you doing up there? You're going to have a heart attack shoveling all that snow. And he plays golf, too. He can't play golf all winter. It's like, dude, you can play golf all year here. But he's my friend. Mark Denning is his name. And I value his friendship, and I value, I appreciate him as a brother in Christ. He's been my friend for 30-some years. We need friends, Amen. Two are better than one, and a cord of three strands not easily broken. We need each other, church. Well, no one's friendly to me. Go stop that. You be a friend to somebody else, and you'll have more friends. That's the spirit of Christ, the one who was friends to us and laid his life down for us. So you ready to get in the chapter? Uh, Romans 16. Let's get in. Here we go. Now I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. Now, Centria was a port, eastern port, of the city of Corinth, where Paul is writing from. It's a port city, right, right by Corinth. That you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. And that you help her in whatever manner she may have need of you. For notice, she herself has been a benefactor. Another version says, a helper of many and of myself as well. Now, the first person listed, interesting to me, first friend of Paul, first fellow servant of Paul, first fellow worker for the kingdom of God, it's a woman. And what's interesting about her is this. She's listed as a servant of Christ. Now, the word servant there is the same exact word used in 1 Timothy 3 when it's talking about deacons. And so many people believe she had an official office in the New Testament church of being a deaconess for the, for the church there in Corinth. And what's interesting too to me is we see the importance, women, listen, we see the importance of women being involved in ministry. Seven friends, Paul lists of the 26 there in Rome, are disciples that were women. Ladies, your ministry in this church is very important. Some of Jesus' best laborers for the kingdom, some of Jesus' closest friends, some of Jesus' disciples listed all throughout the scriptures were women. The women that were, were the ones that stayed by Jesus at the cross where all the guys fled to the upper room. The women were there ministering to Jesus in his final hours and the first person Jesus appeared to in his resurrection, uh, post-resurrection state was Mary Magdalene. Guess what? A woman. Very important what you ladies do in this church. I love the fact that we have so many um, Phoebes in this church. Women that are involved in ministry and doing great stuff for the kingdom of God. Don't stop, ladies. Here's a, do more, ladies, for the kingdom of God. Because we need you. We need your hearts. We need your passion. We need your gifts. We need your work for the kingdom of God. You, got, you ladies make a big difference in this church. Amen? Women, very involved. And the interesting thing to me is probably this, this Phoebe was a businesswoman. Because it says she was a, my version says she was a benefactor of many, which means she probably had means. She had, so which means, whoo, some moolah. And she, she worked hard in her business so she had extra resources so she could be a helper, a benefactor of many. Many scholars believe this Phoebe was actually the one that brought this letter of the book of Romans because she was probably going from Corinth to Rome on a business trip. And Paul said, hey, bring this letter with you on your business trip and bring it to the church in Rome. 
Now, can you imagine her having the book of Romans in her pouch? And she had no idea that this letter that she was bringing to this church in Rome would be a letter that would lead Martin Luther to Christ. It was a letter that would lead John Wesley to Christ. It was a letter that would change literally millions and millions, including my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith. He had a grace awakening and woke him up with grace through teaching through the book of Romans. It's amazing. And a lady was the one that brought it to the church in Rome, and she had no idea what was on that scroll. But for centuries, for millennials now, lives have been changed and saved and and touched by the book of Romans. And Phoebe's the one that brought it to the church in Rome. Amen? And so the first principle we see here for the spirit of Christ, the second, the first was the spirit of friendship. The second is, it's a spirit of service. It's a spirit of service. This lady loved to serve. And she made kingdom differences because she had a spirit that wanted to serve the Lord. What did Jesus say about service? Mark 10, he said this, calling them to himself, Jesus said this, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them, but it's not that way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you should be a, there it is, be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served But to what? There's the spirit of Christ. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I love what Philippians 2 says about the spirit of Christ. And it exhorts us to have that same spirit. It says this, Philippians 2, 5. Have this attitude. I could translate that. Have this spirit in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a what? There it is, a bondservant. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You want to have the spirit of Christ? Wash feet. Be a servant. You know, I'm married to a servant. (laughs) My wife, Heidi. She's her love language, one of her chief love languages. We're going to be studying love languages when we get to this marriage conference. But one of her chief love languages is uh, acts of service. And when you have a love language like that, that's the way you show love to other people. She just loves to serve. She is just a servant. We had our, our third grandbaby uh, a couple weeks ago. She's ditched me twice in the last two or three weeks. She said, see you later, alligator. I'm out of here. And she went up for the first week after the baby was born for three days, or four, three or four days, and all night long, staying up all night long, holding that baby and helping our, our daughter-in-law, Kristen, so she could get some sleep after the baby wakes up. And she, she's 60-some years old. I shouldn't have said that, but she's 60-some years old. And she's staying up all night because she just wants to serve, man. She wants to serve. And then she left me again this week. Well, I'm going to go up again. For two days, stayed up all night. Bless her heart. I watched JoJo. And she, she was up there serving again. And that's the spirit of Christ, you guys. Serving, amen? Greatest among you shall be a servant. And that's what this Phoebe was. She was a servant for Jesus Christ. And then it goes on. Two other people he mentions. Greet Prisca. Uh, Priscilla is another uh, way to say the name. Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, who not only do I give thanks, but also to all the churches of the Gentiles, also greet the church. Notice, where did the church in Rome meet? In Priscilla and Aquila's house. The church buildings didn't come into effect until the second century. The Christians didn't have the means to have their own buildings, so they met in homes. And this, this, this couple Priscilla and Aquila actually had a house in Rome, and they probably had some means too because it was big enough to house the church. Now listen, this was a special couple. They're listed six times through the New Testament, Priscilla and Aquila. Paul met them first of all in Acts chapter 18 when he was making tents and starting the church in Corinth where he's writing from, and, and, and they had, it says in Acts 18, 1 to 3, they had the same trade as Paul. They were tent makers. So Paul, which he normally did, is he, he would lead them to people to Christ. He led Aquila and Priscilla, I believe, to Christ. And they became part of his team. 
And then they went from uh, Corinth, they went all the way from Corinth to Ephesus, where a great church was started there in the city of Ephesus. That's what the uh, letter to the Ephesians is all about, that church in Ephesus. And then they actually, they went then from Ephesus, now we see them in Rome. Now, originally, we're told in Acts 18, they came from Rome. But there was a Roman emperor, his name was Claudius, who got sick of all the Jews in Rome, and the Roman emperor kicked all the Jews out of Rome, and that's how they landed. So- sovereignty of God was involved, because that's how they landed in Corinth, and then they got, they got saved and got involved in Paul's team. But look what it says about this couple. It says, they risked their necks for Paul and for the kingdom of God and for the church of the Gentiles. That's the third spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of friendship. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of service. The third thing is the spirit of Christ is a spirit of sacrifice. And even being willing to take a risk for the kingdom of God. And that's what this couple did. Repeatedly, we're, st- we're told here in the Greek, repeatedly they risked their very necks for Paul and for the kingdom of God. It's sacrifice, man. Sacrifice. And by the way, I look for Aquila and Priscilla's in this church. Because I see oftentimes when a husband and a wife are together, two are better than one, and they're both passionate about serving Christ, and they're both willing to take risks for the kingdom of God, and they're both wanting to be a part of making a difference for Christ. Man, some of the, some of the power players in our church are couples. Because there's a synergy that happens when a husband and wife both want to serve the Lord, Right? I think about uh, Wayne and Margie Coker that come to our church. They were at the very first service almost 26 years ago, and they've been with us ever since serving the Lord in this church. They were at Aquila and Priscilla in my book. I think about Joe and Crystal Scott. They've been with us now almost 15 years, and they just both passionately serve the Lord. They're at Aquila and Priscilla in my book. And I see so many of you couples, likewise, that love Jesus together and serve Jesus together as Aquila and Priscilla. You make a huge difference for the kingdom of God. And I know it's risky, I know it's, it's, it takes your time. I know it's sacrifice on your part. But listen, we only have one life to live, and it'll soon be passed, and only what we do for Christ is going to last. Amen? It's wonderful. Risking your neck. I like that phrase. Taking sacrifices for the kingdom of God. And why do we do that? Because what did Jesus do for us? We celebrated this morning. He sacrificed everything for us. And again, greater love has no man than this. He laid down his life for his friends, and we should sacrifice for him, amen? And sometimes when these couples come together and they sacrifice together, they make huge kingdom differences. Interesting also, when you sacrifice for Christ, you know what? You got joy. You know, Jesus talked about this. You wanna find your life and have more joy in your life? Then serve and sacrifice for the kingdom. I like what he said in Matthew about that. He said this, Um, If anyone wishes, Matthew 16, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know what he's saying there? You want to find more life, give more of your life away in service and sacrifice, Right? And if you deny yourself and take up your cross, make sacrifices for the kingdom, that's when you're going to have more joy. Because joy, again, is an acrostic. Put Jesus first, others second, yourself last, you'll have more joy. Remember I, when I was back in Chicago and I was a college student, I was going to Dr. Dave's Bible study. I remember um, in Dr. Dave's Bible study, we had all these college students and young adults and stuff. And a new girl came in in the Bible study. And whenever a new girl would come into the Bible study, I, I was single. This is BH before Heidi. And I was going to meet that new girl. And there's a new girl in the Bible study. And she was cute. So I made a point after Bible study. I'm going to meet her. And, I, and we talked and stuff. And, um, and I said, what's your background? What's going on? She goes, well, I got saved. And after getting saved, I went through a real rough patch. This is just like a year before this. And I had this spiritual warfare thing going on. And I actually, after I got saved, she said, I went into a depression. I mean, it was like clinical depression because of the warfare that was going on. And I said, well, 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 you got the joy of the Lord. Now what happened? She said, in the midst of that depression, what I did is I decided I was going to spend my summer going on a mission trip. And I got out of myself. And I went on this mission trip to this third world country. And I served all last summer, she said. And you know what happened? The depression went away. 
And the joy of the Lord took over. Because I was serving and sacrificing my whole summer as a college student. You want more joy? Serve the Lord. Be like Aquila and Priscilla. Risk your neck for the kingdom of God, man. Make a difference in sacrifice and service. You'll find joy in that. Now, it goes on, and let's keep with our list here. Now, it goes on, it says, also greet the churches in their house. Greet, uh, verse five, greet of Eponidas, my beloved, who's the first convert to Christ from Asia. Now, that's interesting because Paul lists this friend now in Rome that was his beloved, but also was the first person that Paul led to Christ in Asia, where many of Paul's churches were started. And and he's kind of reminiscing. This guy that I led to Christ at the very beginning of my ministry is still serving the Lord in the city of Rome, in the church in Rome. And he's just kind of, I could see him writing that and just saying, oh, it's so good to see him still serving the Lord. You know, Heidi and I started our first church in North County, San Diego, in Carlsbad and then Oceanside. And the very first service, we gave an opportunity for people to receive Christ. Several did. And there was this one lady by the name of Monty. And she came to Christ, and she became a Phoebe. She was a servant for the rest of the time we were in that church in Southern California. And she went on to become Heidi's best friend. And when I was thinking about this Eponidas, who was a first convert to Christ by Paul in the, in the area of Asia, I was thinking of Monty. Because Monty was the first person, I as a brand new pastor at 24 years old, starting a brand new church, she was the first person that came to Christ as we started that church. And she became a Phoebe, a servant of the Lord. Isn't that special when you get the opportunity to lead people to Christ and then they keep walking with Christ and you see the fruit of sharing Christ with that person? It's wonderful. That's what Eponidas was to Paul. Greet Mary, verse 6, who has labored so much for you. Greet Andrianachus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are standing to the apostles who are also in Christ before me. Greet Apollonidas. Why don't they have Marys and Sallys and Harrys and... My beloved in the Lord, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. Greet Apellus, the proven in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristopolis. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trifina and Trifosa. Those are two ladies, and they mean delicate and dainty. Good names. Laborers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who labored much in the Lord. Now, going back on those few verses we just read of these friends of Paul, these servants of Christ, I want you to see something. Four different references to their work. Go back to verse 9, or I'm sorry, go back to verse 6. Greet Mary, who's labored much for you. Uh, go back to verse 9. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Go back to verse 12. Uh, Trophina and Trophosa, laborers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who, notice again, labored much in the Lord. You know what the spirit of Christ is? It's not only a spirit of friendship, it's a spirit of risk and sacrifice, it's a spirit of service. The spirit of Christ seen in these Christians here is a spirit that's willing to work hard for the kingdom of God. Someone who says, I'm going to put my sleeves up and I'm going to do something for Jesus in my life. That's the spirit of Christ. You know, one time Jesus was in his public ministry. Jesus worked really hard for those three years of public ministry. I mean, he'd work from morning till late at night serving people and healing people and loving people and teaching people. And and one time he was working so hard for his father in heaven that he wasn't eating. And so his disciples came to him and said, God, Jesus, you gotta eat. And it says in, in John 4, 31, the, the, the disciples were urging Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. But Jesus said, now I have food to eat that you don't know about. And so the disciples were saying, well, no one has brought anything for him to eat, did he? And so Jesus said to his disciples, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his what? His work. That's the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit of work. Let's do something for the Father, for the Father's will. Let's work for the kingdom of God. You know, um, one of the greatest examples to that of me, of someone that loved to work for the kingdom, was a former elder who's now with the Lord. His name was Jose. And Jose came to us from Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, up in New Jersey. And he would, I remember he'd come to men's breakfast, and he would light up the men's breakfast because he was so on fire for Christ. I remember he would come to men's breakfast, 7.30 on Saturday morning, and a lot of us just didn't have much of our coffee in the state. We're all just kind of, all right, we're going to get in the bottle, so like this. 
And Jose would come in a, a couple minutes late, and we're all kind of uh, like this. Jose would go, like, what is this, a funeral? Wake up, guys. He'd wake us all up, and he was from Puerto Rico and had that accent, and he was just on fire for the Lord, man. But I remember Jose ended up getting cancer, and he got serious cancer in the stomach. He's one of my best friends, so I love that guy. And, the, and right in the midst of his cancer, we started building this new sanctuary. And Jose didn't care that he had cancer. He, he was a construction mode kind of guy. He had his own uh, home remodeling business and stuff. He said he was going to get in on this building. And I was like, Jose, you got cancer. Don't let the other guys do the work. He would show up. And I remember the Saturday right before our grand opening. This was maybe a few couple weeks out before Easter, before our grand opening in this building. Jose, he, he was on the stage with me. And he had his nail gun with like, I think he already had like stage three or stage four cancer. He spent a whole day on Saturday building this stage with this wood. Bam, 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 bam. And he wanted to do that for the kingdom of God with stage three or four cancer. He was a worker in the Lord. Listen, that is the spirit of Christ, willing to, to serve the Lord with your gifts and your talents and work hard, Amen. And that's what these laborers did that were friends of Paul. Let's go back to our scripture now. It says, greet, this is an interesting friend right here, verse 13. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Now that's very interesting because we know from Mark chapter 15, verse 21, this Rufus was the son of Simon of Cyrene. And what's interesting about that is most scholars believe this is the connection, was his dad, Simon, Mark 15, 21, was the one who was enlisted to carry the cross for Jesus Christ. And, it's, and Paul now addresses him as a friend. And not only that, Paul had a close enough relationship with this Rufus, the son of Simon, that his, he, he was close with his mother too. He said, and your mom, who's become a mother to me. Now, can you imagine some of the conversations that Paul had with this friend who is the son of the one that carried Jesus' cross? I can't imagine. I could see Paul saying, you know, I used to be a persecutor of Christians. I used to hold a sword to Christians' necks, and then I got struck by this Jesus on the Damascus Road, and now I'm a follower of Christ. Tell me about what your dad did carrying his cross. Tell me how it was. Tell me the stories your dad told you about the way that he walked up to Golgotha with Jesus' cross. And then he witnessed firsthand deity dying for us. And he witnessed firsthand Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. What was it like when your dad saw that and then saw the earthquake and saw the people coming out of the tombs because of the mass, cosmic, amazing stuff that was happening as Jesus died for our sins? Tell me about that. And that's probably some of the interaction he had with this Rufus who became. And it's interesting, which tells us this here too, is that because of what happened at the cross there, his dad, his mom, and the sons all became Christians disciples of Jesus Christ. Now verse 14, greet Asecritus and Philegion and Hermas and Petrobus and Hermas and the brothers with him. And greet, tough names again, Philologos. Now, you know what the, those, those two Greek words right there, Philologos. Philio is love, Logos is right here, the word. And so this guy's name, I love his name, Philologos, a lover of God's Word. Isn't that what we're supposed to be, church? I love Calvary Chapel. And one of the reasons I love Calvary Chapel, because it's a whole bunch of people that love Jesus and love God's word. I love the fact that I I don't have people going like this after 40 minutes of taking, this is Pastor John, going to be done. No, I got people in our church that like, let's get into the word. Why are you quitting so early? Because I want to study more of God's word. We're called to be lovers of God's word. Amen? Philo Logos, so maybe we all be lovers of God's word. And Julia, and Nurus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a... And all the churches of Christ greets you. Okay, we're to be not just hearers of God's word, we're to be doers. So turn to the people right next to you, give them a big fat... Well, no, I'm just kidding. 
I remember we were, we were studying with all the college students in our last church, 1 Corinthians, and it ended chapter 16 the same way. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And I kind of pulled that on them. Hey, college students, all kids, no, stop right now, stop. But then after the church service, <laughs> I'll never forget this. This is like 30 years ago. After the church service, I told, hey, we're, we're going to greet one another with a holy kiss. I'm greeting a brand new family in the church. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, build a bridge there and greet them and stuff. And two of these big college guys that I was buddies with, they came up on both sides of me as I'm greeting this new family in the church after the service. And they gave me kisses on both sides. They sandwiched with me with holy kisses. I'm going, Stop! Damien Kyle said, you know, there's nothing that will make my kiss more holy than having to kiss a man. Okay, here's the deal. In that culture, same sex, they, they, would, they would have synagogue style in their worship. They'd have men on one side. They'd have women on the other side. And one of the ways they'd greet one another wasn't hugs or handshakes. It was a kiss on both cheeks. Cheeks. I've told in Italy and other places still today, men will come up to each other. Mm, mm. Now, we don't need to do that, guys. But what, what is this telling us? It's telling us this. The spirit of Christ is also a spirit of love and affection. And it's okay. It's okay for us to show love and affection. And we should show love and affection for one another. Holy hugs, good stuff. Holy hugs, handshakes, love, and affection. Jesus said to you, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another, right? And I love the fact, I'm st starting to get here earlier before the 9 o'clock service. I love the fact that a lot of you get people come here like 30 minutes before service and you're hanging out in the patio, you're hanging out in here, and it's because you love the fellowship and you love the people here. That should be a sign of true, the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ is not only a spirit of friendship, it's a spirit of love and affection for other brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because we're family. And true family, good families, love one another. Amen? And we're not going to start kissing each other around here. I get that. But let's, let's show love and affection, just as we're told, uh, with holy hugs or holy handshakes. Now it goes on, verse 17. Now I urge you, brothers, to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and stumblings contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but to their own stomach. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Now here's what Paul's saying. There's people who are sneaking into the church in Corinth. And through their flattery and their smooth speech, they're bringing division and disunity. Remember what Jesus prayed for the church in the high priestly prayer? Three times he prayed during his prayer for the church. John 17, Father, let them be one as you and I are one. Father, let them be perfected in unity just as you and I, Father, are perfected in unity. And you know what? When people come into the church, we're told this in the scripture, and they start trying to cause fights and division and strife within the body of Christ, what does it say to do? Two things. Keep an eye on them. And the second thing it says to do is have nothing to do with them. Stay away from people that are divisive and negative. You know why? Because if you enter in to entertain that stuff, what happens is you become part of the problem instead of the solution, and your entertaining makes you an accomplice to their negativity and their division. And actually, we're told by Paul in the letter of Titus how to handle people that are being divisive and causing negativity and causing all kinds of disruptions within the body of Christ. Titus 3, this is one time I like the NIV version better. It says, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Verse 10, NIV version says, warn a divisive person once, warn them a second time. After that, have what? Nothing to do with them. Again, keep your eye on them and stay away from them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They're self-condemned. Why do so many churches have all these problems? They have all these conflicts. It's like a war zone going to some churches. You know why? Because they're not applying the scripture. They're not warning people, stop. They're sweeping it under the carpet rather than dealing with them and say, Stop. I'm warning you, don't be so divisive, don't cause this conflict, quit slandering, quit gossiping, and listen, I'll warn you once, I'll warn you twice, but then we're done. I'm not going to hang out with you anymore because I don't want to participate in the cancer that you're bringing to God's church. 
Amen? Let's guard our unity here. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. That's the Psalms. It's saying it's a good thing for us to be one in Christ. Let's guard that. How do you guard it? When people come to you with negative stuff, say, don't talk to me about it. Go deal with that person you're slandering or whatever. If you, wanna, if you have an issue with that person, I, don't get me involved. Go talk to that person. Matthew 18, 15. Go to that brother in private and deal with it and redirect him to the person they're talking about. Amen? Amen. Let's go on now with our scripture. And then it says, after that, it says, verse 19, for the report of your obedience has reached to all, therefore I'm rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good, and notice, innocent in what is evil. And I love this verse. And the God of peace will soon what? You've got to crush Satan. I love it. Under your feet. Oh, that's a verse I love. You know why I love that verse? Because that's a victory verse, man. I love victory. Romans is chock filled with victory verses. Go back to Romans 8. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 again tells us very clearly we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. It says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, right? Philippians 4, 13, another victory verse. I can do some things. No, I could do all things through Christ who loves, loves me. And you know what? So many times I see Christians that aren't banking on these verses. And they're walking around like a, a defeatist person who's just saying, oh, woe is me. I've got all this warfare going on. And I can't, oh, I'm not, I just don't, oh, I've lost, I'm oh, down, I'm, uh, whatever. Stop it. Satan's soon going to be crushed under our feet by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that we sang about this morning. We've, I've read the book of Revelation. We win. We win. And the God, amen, we win. And, and, and our God soon is going to crush our enemy under our feet. When, ultimately? When he's thrown in the lake of fire. And I'm going to be on the sidelines, man, cheering for that. This one that's caused so much problems in our lives is going to be ultimately thrown in the lake of fire. But listen, Colossians tells us he's already been disarmed. He's already uh, been defeated on the cross. When, he, when Jesus took our certificate of debt, it says he disarmed the principalities and powers. Let's throw that up there. Colossians chapter 2. He disarmed the principalities and the, the, the rulers and authorities. That's Satan and his demons have been disarmed. And he's made a public display of them, having, notice the word there, having triumphed over them through him. Do you see that? We shouldn't live defeatist lives. We should live lives of victory because of what's already happened at the cross. And again, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory because of what happened on the cross. Amen? He's already been defeated. It's just a matter of time until he's thrown in the lake of fire. And so let's have a victorious spirit. Let's have a spirit that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen, church? Let's, let's go to that spirit of victory. I love the spirit of victory we have in Christ. Now let's close up our letter to Romans. And it says this, verse 20. And the God of peace, peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Notice verse 20b. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. Timothy was Paul's right-hand man. And he's with him again in Corinth. And so does Lucius and Jason and uh, Sospatar and my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter to you, greet you in the Lord. Now, Tertius was Paul's secretary. He was just dictating this letter to him, and he puts a little ad in there. Yeah, I'm the one that's actually writing this letter. In verse 20, 23, Gaius, host to me and the whole church. So this Gaius, who Paul mentions, we'll see when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said that Gaius is one person in Corinth that Paul did baptize, and the church in Corinth was actually meeting again in his house. He greets you. Aristus, the city treasurer, greets you. Now that's interesting too because this council man, the, one of the leaders of the city of Corinth, now has come to Christ. And he's greeting, the, he's a friend of Paul in Corinth that's greeting the church in Rome. You know, what's, you know what, you know what's interesting? Because archaeologists, as they were excavating the city of Corinth, found on pavement from the first century the name Aristus, the treasurer, of the city of Corinth. That's what I love about the Bible. 
It's not a bunch of made-up fairy tales or fables. It's historical, accurate truth. The one that's mentioned here by Paul in the first century was found in the 20th century to be on the pavement of the excavation of the very city of Corinth. And then it says this, after Aristus, it says, Cortus, the brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you, southerner here, with y'all, amen. Now to him, now this is the benediction of the uh, letter to Rome. Now to him, who is able, again, victory, able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures, the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the Gentiles, leading to what? The obedience of faith. And I love this benediction closing. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the what? Glory forever, and the church says, amen. Amen, amen means so be it. Now listen, church. The last thing I want you to see about the Spirit of Christ here, two times in these, this closing section, Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Two times, he repeats himself. What's the Spirit of Christ? Lastly, it's a spirit of what? Grace. It's a spirit of mercy. It's a spirit of forgiveness. Grace is giving people undeserved merit in favor. So in closing this morning, hmm, who do you need to show grace towards? The Spirit of Christ we're seeing right here is the Spirit of grace. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to show some mercy towards? Is it a parent that maybe abused you or hurt you? Is it a spouse or maybe an ex-spouse that betrayed you? Is it a kid that's gone prodigal that's really messing with you right now? Is it somebody at work that insults you and slanders you? You know what Jesus said? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen? Jesus said, pray this way. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Jesus made it very clear that he was a person of grace, but he's calling his disciples to be people of grace also. Amen? That we have no room in our lives as disciples of Christ to hold a grudge against anybody because God doesn't hold a grudge against us. We sin every day of our lives and God forgives us and commands us in his word, Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Why should we be a forgiving people? Because we're a forgiven people. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. What did we learn about the Spirit of Christ this morning? Seven things. Interesting, seven is the number of completion. We learned that, first of all, the Spirit of Christ is a spirit of what? Friendship, there it is. Secondly, we learned that the Spirit of Christ is a spirit of service. Number three, the Spirit of Christ is a spirit of sacrifice for others. We risk our necks for other people. Number four, the Spirit of Christ is a spirit that what, what works what? hard for the kingdom of God. Number five, the spirit of Christ is a spirit of love and affection for brothers and sisters in Christ. Number six, the spirit of Christ is a spirit of, oh, I like this one, victory! The spirit of Christ, lastly, is a spirit of grace. Mercy, grace. So if you're here this morning, it might be, and you haven't experienced God's amazing grace yet, I have a question for you. What are you waiting for?